Hey, I'm Rylan Hartley of the Rochester Nighthawks, and you're watching Lacrosse Link, your link to all things lacrosse. Hello, lacrosse friends, and welcome to Lacrosse Link, your link to all things lacrosse. I am your host, Stephen Stamp. This week, we are going with a best of lacrosse link theme. I have been a little limited, uh, a little health issues, a bit of a, a uh, infection. Got to keep going back to the hospital. Got my tap in, ready to go get some more antibiotics in a little while. So we are going to run a few of our favorite interviews from so far this season in Lacrosse Link. We're going to open up with a December 8th interview with Patrick Dodds. He was a rookie with the Panther City Lacrosse Club. Um, after the first week in the NLL season, he had what to most folks was probably a surprisingly successful first game in the league. He uh, wasn't certainly a highly touted draft pick. He was let go. Well, no, he wasn't protected by Calgary heading into the expansion draft. PCLC grabbed him. They were very happy to get him, but he was a second rounder uh, with not enormous expectations. Well, now we're 14 weeks in. He is still second among rookie scorers in the league, trailing only the great Jeff Teat. Behind him on the rookie scoring, rookie scoring list, there's a trio of his fellow righties, all of whom selected among the top four overall in the last two drafts, all of whom far more heralded Ryan Smith, Trey LeClaire, De Hogan, Anticoke. They've all played well. He is ahead of every one of them in the scoring race. He's scored game-winning goals. He's been huge week in and week out for PCLC. And given that he has maintained the level of performance he reached in game one through a week 14, seems like a good time to go back and revisit that interview from how it all started for Patrick Dodds. Also, I talked to Kelsey Couge from October 21st. It's nice to put some spotlight back on the women's game, which is absolutely booming. It's going to explode over the next couple of years. A big step coming up soon is the SheBox tournament in Radotin, a suburb of Prague in Czech Republic. That's happening April 22nd to 25th at the Glorious Box, where the European Box Invitational and then the Alice Rebeski um, are played, the Alice Rebeski Memorial are played, and there are five teams going to be at the E-Box this year. It's largely organized by Brian Whitmer. I touched base with Brian, who has been a guest on Lacrosse Link. There are teams from Netherlands, Germany, Norway, Ireland, and a mixed European team taking part in what will be the inaugural E-Box. It was scheduled for 2020, but obviously couldn't happen in April of that year because the pandemic had just touched down. So, that will be the interviews for this week. I think you'll enjoy them both, whether you've seen them before or whether you're catching them again um, to see how things are holding up. And we're going to go with a rundown from January 8th. That was right after the Ryan Banesh trade. As Banesh went from Panther City to Al Albany, we thought that it seemed like a huge deal for the Firewolves at the time to really help that offense that had lost Callum Crawford over the uh, extended offseason. So we broke it down with an Albany rundown. Well, since Ryan Banesh has been there, he's been excellent in his own right. He's fourth in the league right now in goals, sixth in assists, also fourth in points. But on top of that, with Banesh across the floor from him, Joe Rezateritz has been probably the hottest player in the league. In fact, Rezateritz is leading the NLL in goals and points as we speak. So they are quite a one-two punch, making it a good time to rerun this look at the Banesh acquisition. Enjoy the best of lacrosse link this week, and we'll see you back here next week, hopefully with a brand new live show with brand new fresh interviews. Regardless of the crease call, and that shows he is at his acrobatic level. In the middle, it just bounces off, but it's picked up and scores! Welcome to Lacrosse Link. Patrick Dodds, what an exciting weekend for you, making your NLL debut. Thanks for coming on the show. It's, uh, it's great to chat with you. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I'm happy to be here. So... I know it's no, it's not many young lacrosse players' dreams to get drafted in the NLL. That's obviously a dream, but then to get uh, moved to a different team before you ever get a chance to play, but uh, in the league. But a lot of things have happened to a lot of people in the the COVID era, so it must have been pretty exciting to get through all the waiting, all the anticipation, and get out on the floor on uh, last weekend. Yeah, I was lucky enough to get drafted. Uh... 
by Calgary a couple of years ago and then uh, got picked up in the expansion draft. And I think um, looking back, I think that's going to be a positive for my career for sure. Um, uh, Tracy's a, an amazing guy, everything and everything going on in that organization is top notch. So I'm super happy where I am now and just happy to be uh, happy to be uh, on on a Monday now uh, after the weekend of my first game. So in that first game, you go in uh, as a rookie, and, and it was a big weekend for rookies all around the league. I mean, guys stepping in, and that, I think, was one of the questions was, how are the rookies going to be? There's a lot of rookies because there's two draft classes, not everyone coming in because some guys are going back to college. But what was it? what's it been like preparing, waiting for so long, and then coming in when – you have bear. I mean, you got a chance to play this summer. You did uh, the BC Junior League and you played uh, World Juniors in Winnipeg. So you got a chance to play some, but nothing like the normal preparation for somebody starting their pro career. Yeah, I think I was lucky to play a bit of junior. Um, I think it's pretty awesome. There's a, there's a lot of good rookies in the league right now. Um, had a few weeks of camp. I think we were in a good four weeks of camp in Toronto. Um, it's obviously never really enough. You never, you always want to be a, a little better, a little better before you start your first game. But I think all in all, um, especially playing this summer a little bit, um, helped me out quite a bit for sure. And you get into this game and uh, a bunch of things happen. You have a goal and four assists, right? It's, it was four. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So pretty big day, obviously to start out your career and, a couple of plays that really stood out, the uh, the flip pass where you just kind of drew the defender down with you, flipped it around him over to, to Phil Caputo and set him up for a golden opportunity that he buried. Um, you also had your first goal where you used your size. You're a big guy, like 6'3", 205, 210? Yeah, yeah, yeah around there, yeah. yeah. Um, you come in and you do the old, um, it, it's uh, the shoulder in, lean into the defender, get him moving back, kind of reach around and get the shot off and bury that. So you looked, I thought, very comfortable on the floor and very comfortable with the guys you're out there with, like Phil Caputo and Mike Triolo and, and uh, all the guys on the offense. How quickly did everything gel? Because it, it looked, I mean, there was some rust, I thought, in all the games to start, but it, it seemed to come off really quickly. And the quality of play, to me, looked like it was really high faster than I think most people would have expected after so much time off. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I say credits to um, our D guys played well and credits to our O guys. Um, I think we kind of gel off each other and it's pretty easy when Phil sets me a hard screen. All I got to do is run in a straight line and flip him the ball. So he's, he really does all the work and um, he made it super easy, easy last night um, or the other night. Um, yeah, and, and Benny kind of, obviously, a vet of all vets kind of coaching us through um, a couple rookies on offense there. Um, yeah, it helps to have a guy who's scored a thousand goals, right? Or a thousand points in the NLL. Yeah, so it's no, no better guy to be kind of uh, uh, guiding us uh, rookies and a couple other younger guys on the team just to kind of learn how to be a pro. What was the atmosphere like for you for your first pro game? Because, I mean, obviously you're going to get some some good crowds in, in junior and things, but it's a whole different world, right, when you step out on this pro floor. Yeah, no, as we all know, uh, the, the fans in Philly have a history of being uh, pretty intense. So it, it was good. Definitely, uh, definitely heard some things I'm not going to repeat and uh, some gestures, but, you know, it was, it was awesome. Uh, they are loud and uh, obviously loud and booing us and everything but it was it was pretty awesome especially during the anthems the lights the the cameras that was a pretty cool moment to take in what did you feel like what did you kind of what went through your head when you got that first goal when you you know you make the move and you see the ball just disappear behind the goalie i think um yeah it just kind of all of a sudden i got a one-on-one -on -one match up there take the shot and it was lucky enough to go in. I, I was, holy, holy cow, there you go. <laughs> and then uh, got to the bench, definitely was a little shaky for a second, kind of realizing what just happened. But um, after that, it was 
back to business next shift. We got a I got a game to win here. And I mean, you mentioned it's different. I mean, it's the the atmosphere. A lot of things are different. Um, you you it's scoring goals is nothing you're not familiar with. Obviously, you've scored plenty of goals in your career, but it, you said it kind of hit you a bit different. What felt different about just the general play, the level of play, the pace, the 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 entire atmosphere of being in the pro game out there with the with such great athletes um i think the the attention to detail um i think obviously as everybody knows the nll is a is a tight league um obviously we lost by one in overtime and that's like oh maybe do i not hit the post on that shot i score that shot or i don't miss that pass or something it's tiny little things that amount to a big things Mm -hmm. and then in turn unfortunately we didn't get the win on Saturday but um, obviously there's things we could have done earlier in the game to not be in the situation to go to overtime. I guess part of it and this is something that comes with more experience you hear all the time guys having to learn everyone has to learn the lesson of like you said think about oh if I hadn't done this if this hadn't happened if we'd done this if we'd done that and you want to remember all those things and build on all those and try and tidy them up like you said but you also need to forget them to an extent right and just be ready to move on to the next one take the what you've learned from it but forget about whatever happened and get ready for week two yeah no absolutely I think um kind of in the game you're not thinking about that after the game you look back and you're like you know what maybe I maybe I could have cut right there. I was watching film this morning. There's definitely some things that I could have done better um, for sure. And, and then it's, it's more for me, it's like in practice next week, am I going to, I'll, I'll shoot that shot. I missed a few more times or um, that kind of thing. I would, I wouldn't say uh, we dwelled on mistakes in the game too much. Um, It's just a matter of looking at mistakes and saying, you know what, we could have done this. I could have done this. Um, and then that maybe would have turned the tides in our favor, but, um, yeah, it's all about looking till, uh, looking to next weekend and get our first W. Really appreciate you taking the time and jumping on the show. Uh, Patrick, it's great to have you on. Congratulations for your, your first game, your first goal, your first five point night. And as much as we talked about, you know, Hey, what do you, how do you deal with the mistakes? How do you deal with things that you want to correct? Uh, a lot of things went very well, so it's, I'm, I'm sure you enjoyed it. I know your dad did. I heard, I heard from Will, always do, uh, about his proud dad moment when you put that one in. And uh, congratulations, and uh, really looking forward to watching you progress. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me on. Very pleased to welcome to Lacrosse Link, Kelsey Couche. We're going to get into everything that you've been doing around women's box lacrosse. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Stephen. I'm so I'm pumped to be here. I'm uh, I'm excited to kind of see you. I wish it was in Canada, but uh, it's nice to see a friendly face over Zoom today. Hopefully soon. I mean, we've been talking about doing this for a while and it finally kind of aligned and perfectly having Michelle Boyer on the show and you. You're both doing so much in the uh, field of women's box lacrosse. And I want to talk about your experience in the game because I know when you were at Rutgers, after your junior year, you came up to Ontario. Um, I was actually at the time still helping coach the Peterborough Senior Women's Team uh, five years ago in 2016. And you came and played for the Toronto Stars and had a pretty good experience. You won a provincial championship. How, uh, how was that experience and how did it come about? Man, that was such a fun summer and one that completely changed my life. So, um, I, I, 
this story is pretty pretty wild, but I I, I will always remember. Um, I was introduced to the game by uh, Adam Charlin Beatties. He's a Canadian um, lacrosse player who was playing at Rutgers the same time that I was. And we had a, we had a class together and I loved how he played. It was super creative, also a lefty and, you know, didn't really switch his hands too much. And I'm like, how did you even get away with that? Because, you know, especially with the field game on the women's side, like you're always switching hands. If you don't have a left hand, like you might not even see the field. Right. So I just thought that was, uh, it, it's such an interesting um, and different way to play. And so he would, he introduced me to the sport and I was just like looking up YouTube videos and I was like, dang, like, this is crazy. This, this box across sport that, um, you know, the Canadians play, like, this is just so, so interesting. I'd love to see it real time. Um, and also is this is an opportunity for the female side and where is it? Where is the game out here in the States? So to make a long story short, um, I, spent it a, I spent a summer up in Canada in 2016 and um, actually reached out at the Toronto All-Stars uh, Senior A women's team to see if there was any availability or for a tryout or to play. And um, John Delgesh, he, he was a very kind, awesome coach, very uh, open to teaching me the game. And the players were just so ruthless and phenomenal. It was just such a different experience than I, than I had in the field game. Those, uh, you know, stereotypes of honestly, almost just like the female stereotype of just being like, you know, yeah, you, you got your hair done or, or like, I mean, some girls even threw mascara on before games uh, at the that D1 level because, you know, there's pictures being taken and I didn't, I mean, I understood it. I didn't understand it at the same time, but the, the box across game kind of made me fall in love with that. Like just you're playing, you're playing the sport, you're throwing a helmet on, you're going to get super sweaty. It's aggressive play. You're going to work on your footwork, the speed, and just go out and have some fun. So that's when, so I, that's where I kind of just fell in love, um, fell in love with the sport. And we, we did, like you said, we, we won an Ontario championship together or a provincial championship. Um, you had some great and, players on that team, and Vio Jurich, uh, uh, yeah, was, uh, Danielle Beatty, right? Yep. She, yeah, amazing transition player. I mean, most of played O, but she would just she play D and then just run past people and go score highly skilled. So it was pretty exciting watching that team. If you guys to pull it all, pull it off, and win that championship, um, when Grand River seemed to be winning all the time oh gosh, at that yeah. point with Miquan Tulpin and some other terrific players. So that was a big summer for, for Toronto. And now you've carried on your love of this game. You're out in San Diego now. And what's going on out there? Because I know you've gotten heavily involved in the game on the West Coast, on the admin side, partly so you have a place to play, right? Partly. I mean, the the love of my game and it to, to marry it with being able to to still play is, is really exciting right now. Um, I am working full time with the SEALs. My title is the lacrosse community ambassador. And so I'm working heavily with the lacrosse community out here in San Diego to get into NLL um, games. Let's get some butts and seats. Let's get a super rowdy crowd. Um, and also let's, let's find the love of this game together. And a lot of people don't know about the box lacrosse game still. And so we're, I'm so fortunate to be a part of um, this enterprise out here. So <clears throat> On top of that, um, I am doing a little coaching uh, outside of that. I helped to co-found the Junior Seals program um, on the female side. Cam Holding has directed the Junior Seals. Um, I think they started that in 2020. It's a, it's a very newer program. Um, their numbers are crazy, though. They're already at like 100 kids on the boys' side. But then Cam's I was amazing. He's yeah, he's, he's such one a good of the dude. Great leaders in the game. Oh my gosh, for sure. Yeah. And then um, I was really fortunate to be uh, connected to him through Shaden, Shaden Santos um, with US Boxla. And then um, Shaden was like, you know, Kels will, Kels is going to grow this out here with you guys or, or without. And I was like, I am keen to work with, with the SEALs 110% to get the best coaching, the coaches in the game, you know, there, there are pro players. So and you that's why I wanted teams to give to, to tournaments, right? I mean, you're talking yeah. about a tournament in Arizona that was kind of a first of its kind, right? Yeah, that was actually prior to, to joining and uh, collaborating with the SEALs. So I was um, just grinding through San Diego and, and getting girls to come 
trying to play the sport because I really want to give back. I don't want another girl to sit there and try to type in on Google senior, a women's only box across and not find something, even if it is all the way out in here in San Diego. And what's happening on that side. I know we've, you've hinted to me that, uh, that yeah. senior women's team. Or, or, okay, so I know we're talking about different avenues, but for, for uh, you know, the youth to find something, because now there are teams, you know, there's even Denver's popping off, uh, North Cal has teams, now San Diego. And then, of course, the Women's Senior A Adult League um, is, a, is, is definitely a, a fully in the works. So our co-ed box team, or no, so our Senior A um, Adult League right now is – we are playing pickup every Thursday night and our numbers are growing every single week. We're having a super fun. I've also opened it up to um, two males to come help us build, build a program just to get some numbers so we can play full, you know, full arena for full field because sometimes there would be like six or eight of us that show up and we would just be so pooped. You know, we're not going to just run that full in the box. Like that would be just way too much. So you know, we, we've had nights that we just play 3v3, we play half court. And then now we have nights we've gotten up to 25 people, but yeah, but like, it's actually really funny because we're running around, uh, you know, the PB area, crown point downtown, and we've got something to talk about. And we're starting to really create this momentum and pick up people who either played didn't know that this was out here or looking for something. So we actually play, uh, on Thursday nights, We'll go play pickup. We'll have a, a ton of fun. And then we actually go to this uh, one restaurant called 710 Karaoke. And one of us has to go up there and sing. And, uh, and then we actually announce and say, hey, if there's anyone in here that wants to play lacrosse, like go, go come talk to us. And we go in our pennies and kind of actually try to create a little bit of like a um, just a team pack. And so we've actually signed up uh, four girls that way. One played What's your go-to karaoke song? Sorry, I have oh. to know. No, no, yeah, yeah. So my go-to, my go-to karaoke song is "Mr. Brightside" by The Killers. Oh, nice. It's a little, yeah, it's a little like not. Uh, <laughs> I've got not a deeper voice for for a female, but I'm not the big. I'm not the best singer, Stephen. <laughs> Let's get that <laughs> straight. So <laughs> that's. Kind I, of I like can't a, sing, so when we do karaoke, I tend to do. <laughs> We're uh, talking to the microphone. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do like Iron Man or. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but uh, it's pretty fun uh, getting oh, yeah. out there. Um, so great to have you on. We're, we're running out of time already. I think it goes really quick. There's so much to talk about. I mean, the international game, I did talk with Michelle about the growth internationally. I know mm -hmm. there's a lot happening. You're putting so much into it. Really appreciate what you're doing for the game. Appreciate you coming on and hope you'll come back and just keep us updated on how things are coming along. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, to leave uh, here, like my my dreams are to really bring um, a USA team or be a part of it with Michelle to into worlds for 2024. Um, and then on top of it, eventually get a team from the States to come up to BC or Toronto and, and play the Toronto, Toronto all-stars and, and also, you know, beat them. <laughs> Sounds and, like uh, great things. And I'm sure Having spoken to you several times about this, I know you're going to make things happen. Michelle's making things happen. It's a pretty exciting time in women's box lacrosse. Kelsey Couget, thanks so much for coming on Lacrosse Link. Oh my gosh, Stephen, anytime. Thank you. Can't wait to come back again. Hi, this is Jaden with Al Anderson Source for Sports. Excited to tell you that we got all our new lacrosse product in for this upcoming season. Whether you're playing box or field, our lacrosse experts are going to make sure we get you into the right equipment to elevate your game. At Al Anderson Source for Sports, we know our stuff. This episode of The Rundown is a little different. It will be all Ryan Banesh all the time. Banesh, of course, traded earlier this week, just before we were recording, from the Panther City Lacrosse Club to the Albany Firewolves. So, it's all Banesh. First of all, the trade. Section one of The Rundown. Who gets what? Albany gets veteran and 1,000-point scorer plus Ryan Banesh. Obviously a boost to their offense. Panther City gets the 21st overall pick in the 2022 draft. 
that was a comp pick for Stefan LeBlanc that Albany had acquired for the for that free agent signing for him leaving. So they get that. Also a 2023 fourth round pick and lefty forward Johnny Pearson, whose space, whose spot in Albany, Banesh will basically be taking. Spot number two in the rundown, the Albanesh rundown, is why does it work for Albany? Well, they had the assets, they could afford to give those up. They have two other picks in this year's first round before the 21st pick. They have Philadelphia's pick from the Kevin Crowley trade where they got two first rounders, the first of which they used to get Andrew Q. So they're feeling pretty good about that trade at this point. They'll add another first round talent to Andrew Q in that trade. And they have their comp pick for Callum Crawford, the second first rounder that they received for the Crawford signing with the Riptide. So they've got some good assets. They could afford to give up the 21 this year. Uh, the fourth rounder, you know, generally not players who are making teams right away. So they're they're okay giving that up. And Johnny Pearson, um, not a big deal for them, I feel, because they've already got Durston, Q, and O'Connor on the left side. Banesh comes in. There really isn't a spot for Johnny Pearson. He's a young, talented guy. He was a 19th overall pick four years ago. He wasn't going to get much opportunity in Albany. Now he goes to Panther City, a young team building where he can get an opportunity. So it makes sense for both teams in that way. Part three of the All Benny rundown, why it works for Panther City. They need assets. Albany could spare them. They need assets as an expansion team, a new team building. It's great to have first and second round picks for a team that is in its first, second, third year to add competition, to add depth, to really flesh out a roster with talented players. Um, they also, they do get Johnny Pearson, who hasn't had a lot of opportunity. He's only played a handful of games uh, with San Diego. His first couple of years, he was drafted by Saskatchewan, never got into the lineup there. So he's bounced around. This will be an opportunity for him to show what he can do on the floor. He'll try and get into some games. Also, the window for Ryan Banesh and Panther City Lacrosse Club don't necessarily align. I mean, Banesh a veteran player, obviously later in his career, and Panther City brand new to the league. And Bob Hanley, the GM, talked about how much Banesh brought to the team in a short time. Um, an absolute pro, a great guy to deal with. They feel like he's added a lot already to the franchise. But in terms of really competing for championships, they're pro that it's unlikely for an expansion team to do that right away. Whereas Ryan Banesh, he's ready to go and try and compete and win win a championship. So um, he's he's hoping and Albany are hoping that he will help them do that. Panther City gets some things that are going to help them continue to build their team. We're going to look at the teams that Ryan Banesh has played for as our next point in the rundown, and there's a whole bunch of them. He played a couple of years for the Toronto Rock when he first came into the league. Went to the Edmonton Rush and played for them for a year. Then he spent four years with the Minnesota Swarm. Spent four years with the Buffalo Bandits, which surprised me a bit. It kind of felt like Buffalo was a, a quicker stop, but he was there for quite a while with a you know, very productive team. Then he went to Colorado for a year and a half. He was with Rochester, the old Nighthawks, the original Nighthawks, and then followed, went with them to um, Halifax for a year and a half as that was one of the few in-season trades he's had where he went from Colorado to Halifax and then of course Panther City takes him in the expansion draft and now he is going to Albany so so that comes to nine teams if you count Rochester and Halifax as separate teams um, same franchise but of course different teams so uh, that's a lot and an interesting note by Graham Perrow leads to our final point in the Benny rundown, which is teams he hasn't played for. And Graham does NLL uh, stat of the day, and he, he tweeted out, you know, the teams that ben, Benny has played for and the teams that he hasn't played for or been involved with. There are five of them. There are just five teams in the current NLL that Banesh has not been a part of. The new Philadelphia Wings, the new Rochester Nighthawks, the San Diego Seals, and the New York Riptide, all of whom are only a couple of years old. So limited opportunity. Only one team in the league that's been around for a while that Ryan Banesh has not been part of yet. That's the Calgary Roughnecks. And uh, probably not doesn't bode well for him later in his career, having you know a, a solid job and a new family, the young, uh, the young child in Ontario, probably not going to be going out west. So that may just be the only team that's been around for as long as he has that Banesh doesn't wind up playing for. Never say never, though. 
And uh, I just think it's uh, it's cool to see Ryan Banesh, the way he's been embraced in Panther City, the way he embraced the town and was thanking everyone there. And they were, you know, I talked to Bob Hamley and he made it clear that it was really difficult to make that trade. I also talked to Glenn Clark and they were pretty excited about what Ryan Banesh brings to the team. Now, you've got to see how things will gel. Maybe it takes a bit to figure out roles in Albany, but they were looking for a spark and I think they're going to get that. So pretty cool stuff with Ryan Banesh. I've been with so many teams, a real pros pro. Good luck to him. Good luck to everyone involved in that deal. It's fun to break it down a little bit. If you would like to be part of the Lacrosse Link program of the broadcast, if you'd like to advertise, be a sponsor, we are looking, we're prepared to have sponsors and advertisers and love to have you on board. So you can reach out to me at stamplax at hotmail.com and uh, we can share some information. We would love to have you be part of Lacrosse Link, getting the word out to the entire lacrosse community all around the world here at Lacrosse Link, your link to all things lacrosse. We'll